So uh, Steve mentioned I'm the editor-in-chief of the Buck Institute out in California, just north of San Francisco. We're a nonprofit that produces materials and does workshops for teachers. We partner with school districts and schools. And we have a website full of materials, bie.org, which I'll be referencing some, some from today. So let's get going. Here's a definition of project-based learning. I won't spend too much time on this. I just wanted to leave it there for your um, future reference. This is kind of a textbooky kind of definition. It doesn't quite communicate the excitement and the creativity that's unleashed in a project. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. All right, so we've noticed a big increase in Google searches for project-based learning in the last few years. So PBL is a hot topic, it's trendy. We hope it's not going to be just one of those flash in the pans in education that comes and goes. We don't, think it, we don't think it will be. We think it's a permanent part of 21st century education. But to make sure that we've promoted the idea of a gold standard for project-based learning, what high quality project-based learning should be. Um, now, most of you probably know this, why project-based learning? Well, it leads to greater student engagement, which leads to greater learning is the bottom line. It makes that real world connection for learning, which is so important for both engagement and giving students exposure to the real world. It improves outcomes for student learning. Uh, content is retained longer, so that research has shown, and students gain those 21st century success skills, which I'll talk more about in a second. And finally, it provides great opportunities to use technology, so much a part of students' lives, which is both motivating and helpful for doing projects. All right, we're a little concerned though that as PBL becomes popular, there could be some pitfalls. Uh, for one thing, teachers might be underprepared and undersupported because PBL is not a simple change. It's really a different way to teach. You know, it, it comes from the, the constructivist, um, progressive strain of thought from John Dewey, uh, learning by doing, not just as a, you know, pouring knowledge into students' heads, but actually building understanding as they work through something. So, um, Teachers need time, most of all, to prepare projects, to work collaboratively with each other, to reflect on how they're going at the end. Um, uh, longer school class periods help. Uh, lots of support from the, the community that leaders can help build. So a lot of things need to be in place, the conditions need to be in place for teachers to do PBL well. We're also concerned about PBL light. There could be projects that are done that people say are PBL, but really aren't that rigorous. They're fun, they're hands-on, but really have students learn very much. There's a danger there. And finally, we're concerned that sometimes PBL, uh, people think it's only used for special occasions or some students. So perhaps at the beginning of a year to do a school culture building project, or at the end of the year after testing is over, do a fun activity for kids for a month of May. Um, that's not tr the true use of PBL. We think it could be used for all subjects as a regular part of classroom instruction. And it shouldn't just be for some students. All students deserve PBL. All students can do PBL. Uh, it's English language learners, students who still need basic skill development, and special education students. Everybody can do project-based learning with the right scaffolding and differentiation. And there's a blog post which says more about that if you want to check out our website. All right, John Dewey, the grandfather of PBL, reminded us that just learning by doing, hands-on learning, which he promoted, does not mean that it's necessarily educative. Good John Dewey word there. So it's not necessarily rigorous. The students are just having experiences. So we have to design projects to make them educative. Here's some examples to illustrate our, our point that students uh, should be having main course projects, not dessert or side dishes. Um, so here's some examples of what we call dessert projects, where the teacher sort of introduces the most of the content is taught traditionally, but on the side or at the end of a unit, um, the, uh, a dessert project is assigned, like the classic California missions project in fourth grade, which is not used as much nowadays. But imagine if instead of building a mission, students were asked to decide where the 22nd mission ought to be. Uh, so that's more of a constructive, you know, uh, constructivist, critical thinking, problem solving kind of task, not just building a mission out of cardboard or sugar cubes. You see these all over the country. In Texas, you might have a model of the Alamo. Here's one that could be in Hawaii or some other place, a habitat, uh, a jungle habitat diorama project for science. Uh, web quests about famous mathematicians or famous authors or scientists or inventors. And these are not bad assignments. I wanna make sure that's clear. These are good assignments. It's better than a stack of worksheets and textbook questions all day long and lectures all day long. But they aren't main course PBL, so. Um, Here's an example from an English class of a board game based on the Odyssey. 
And here's an example of commercially produced uh, resources that are called project-based learning, but it's really kind of a set of, it, it, it's a set of materials or activities around a theme. So students might create a newsletter as if they're in ancient Rome. They might have a mock, mock, uh, you know, uh, Senate, Roman Senate meeting or something. So various activities that are under the theme of the Romans, but it's not really a single rigorous project. Basically the project is the unit in main course project-based learning. Here's a chart that compares the two, doing projects versus true main course project-based learning. I won't go over this in great detail, you can read it later, but um, a couple of points. Uh, I, a project is typically done the same year after year, like the, the California Mission Project. The teachers don't, you know, they give directions, kids follow directions, they do it at home on their own, maybe with their parents helping them, of course, with younger students, a little too much perhaps. Um, in contrast, project-based learning is open-ended. They can vary from year to year. There's a lot of room for student voice and choice to, to take it in different directions. Um, it's often done in teams. We think project-based learning should be done in teams often, not necessarily every time, but plenty of opportunities to learn the skill of collaboration. And um, the teacher should be guiding the work too. A lot of it should take place during class time, where the teacher can coach, can provide the scaffolding, can observe students as they work, provide resources and lessons as needed. And so students aren't sort of left adrift on their own after school, which might be an equity issue for some students as well, actually. And um, also, the, the product is not the project. It's, it's products are produced during a project, but it's, it's a process really of inquiry and creation of a product, of a product not just like, say, building a kit uh, of a robot as a STEM project or something. And finally, doing projects are typically not that authentic, but real project-based learning should be authentic to the real world or students' lives. And I'll say more about that in a second. This is drawn from our book, by the way, uh, we published with ASCD in 2015 setting the standard for PBL. Here's an activity from the language classroom uh, that's a more of a dessert project, a travel brochure, which I'm sure you've seen. And these are, again, these are not bad assignments, but they're just not what we would consider main course project-based learning. You know, the things tourists might do on a trip to France. In contrast, what if they had this kind of a driving question for a project, where they need to think about how they'd help an American exchange student prepare for moving to France. And they could decide to do a video or written materials or a presentation, or perhaps the teachers wants them all to do a, a video and that can be the product. But as you can tell, it's much more open-ended, much more rigorous, a lot of ways to answer that question and learn a lot in the course of doing so. All right, there's a cover of the book I mentioned. You can see that, see that book on our website. And so here's our model for gold standard project-based learning, the essential project design elements. So it's got seven elements, and the focus in the center is always the student learning goals, the key knowledge, understanding, and those 21st century success skills that are so important. So I'll talk about each of these elements um, in turn, all seven of them. Here we go. In the center um, is, as I mentioned, the key knowledge is, it, we, we have this image of the railroad tracks because success skills like collaboration, critical thinking, goes hand in hand with the content. You can't learn critical thinking and not think about something. So so I'll make that point that the 21st century skills and the content are taught together in a project very well. Here's some examples of those success skills. We often ask schools to think of your ideal graduate. What would that person be like? And they come up with a list very much like this, a critical thinker, a problem solver, collaborator, communicator, and so forth. And project management skills and self-management are also really important to build it in students. And projects are a great way, great way to learn it. How can you learn to manage projects if you don't have projects to manage? Okay, this, the challenging problem or question, that's kind of at the heart of every project, uh, every gold standard project, often in the form of a driving question or it could be a problem statement. And they could arise from current events like you see in this newspaper, or it could be a, a question that students might, uh, might find authentic to their own lives, like growing up uh, or some issue in their community. The more local, the better, the more real the students, the better. Sustained inquiry, and that's not just looking stuff up not just simple research, but also it's, it's digging deeper. It's sort of a spiral. You, you research something, you find information out, then you ask deeper questions and answer those and reflect on what you're learning and find new sources if you need it. You might also uh, think about your user, your audience for your product, or who you're gonna be sharing your work with. What do they need? What do they want? Kind of like design thinking, it talks about empathy. And, or, what, or what's the best way to use this tool or use this product or use this math concept in the course of doing our project. That's a kind of inquiry also. So lots of ways to do inquiry, but it's in depth over time and students' questions drive it. 
we often say start your project with an entry event, some kind of grabber activity which piques their curiosity, gets them excited, and starts a list of questions called the need to know list. And you can use that list of questions from students as a roadmap for teaching the project uh, for the next couple of weeks. And adding to that list as students dig deeper and ask more questions. So it's an iterative process. They, they try something out, they go back and try it again after they've learned more and found the answers to more of their questions. All right, authenticity, it's real world, and it could be a simulation, like you know, pretend you're going on a trip to France, what would you need? Or it could be a real world trip somewhere, or it could be um, um, you know, some actual issue in their community. Uh, as I said, the more local, the better. There's a real world problem they wanna solve. Um, it involves real world tools and tasks, like the equipment or the processes or the, the kind of procedures that the professionals in the real world might use. It might be authentic and it makes a real impact. It really changes something in the world or helps other students at their school, uh, people in their community, local businesses. So some kind of a, an impact beyond just the classroom. And as I mentioned, relevant to their lives and their interests. All right, student voice and choice. So it could be the problems they, they want to tackle. Students can even find the problem in their community or in the world they want to tackle. Uh, at, at the beginning, teachers might be the ones to do more of that, you know, designing the project for students. But as they get more experience, they can find the problems themselves and think of their own driving questions for projects even. And they have input into the process, who they work with, how they're gonna work, with teacher coaching, I should add. You don't wanna just turn students loose and have them pick their own teams, which can be problematic. And they can choose the, the kind of products they wanna produce, perhaps, like that example I gave earlier of a video or written materials or a presentation to the exchange student going to France. All right, students reflect during a project. Uh, what they're learning, how they're learning, both on the process they're undergoing, how they're, you know, what the process of doing the, uh, the project, the process of learning, how they're creating their products. Um, they might reflect on the, des the design of the project itself and how it's executed, good feedback for the teacher for next time. And they reflect also both during and after. It's not just a final day activity, but at checkpoints during a project, have students reflect, right? write in a journal individually, talk to their teammates, talk as a whole class, how's it going, what are we learning? Uh, it's important to keep that reflection process going throughout. Critique and revision, okay, so it can't just be turned loose. Like I said, you need to have regular structured opportunities for students to critique each other's work, to get feedback from the peer, their peers, the teacher. Um, it could be the audience for their work or user of the products they're creating. And outside experts, mentors, the community, or outside organizations to bring in, in online or in, in person to, to hear students uh, share their rough drafts, uh, give them feedback, and um, you know, see the prototypes for a product they're creating. Or it could be just hearing their answer to a driving question, how they're thinking about it now, and giving feedback on, on how their thinking has evolved. It's uh, important for PDL. Uh, finally, there's a public product. Students' work is, is shared. Um, it could be a formal presentation. It doesn't have to be. It could just be something they offer to people beyond the classroom, make available online or um, in a meeting with somebody, perhaps not, not a formal you know, PowerPoint presentation necessarily. But um, uh, because they have a public audience for their work, it, they know it goes beyond the teacher in the classroom. Motivations increase. They're more accountable for better quality. And they shouldn't just share it. They should actually explain how they created it. And, uh, and the whole process they use to learn. It could be, how'd you use critical thinking during this project? Or how, give me an example of how you followed the steps for innovation, or how well you collaborate as a team, or how'd you overcome some challenges? So it's, there's some reflection about learning. And that leads to the final point that the public product makes student work discussable. You can use it to think about your instruction. Teachers can share their work and say, how'd you get kids to do that? What can I do to make it better? Uh, creates a shared standard for what's good enough quality work at a school or in a department or across a grade level. Also, I should add, it, it helps celebrate. I mean, it's great to have you know, those public exhibitions or having outside experts come, come into the classroom or perhaps par parents as well to celebrate the hard work students have done on the project. Okay, this is all captured on a tool on our website called the Project Design Rubric. You can, there's two, there's another page to this. So you can, Check that out on our website in the resources section at BIE.org. And I want to say uh, it, it's, it's important to not be scared off by this, you know, <laughs> talk about the gold standard. It's not meant to be this, this unreachable target. So start somewhere. 
And if, if you're just beginning, it's fine to not have all those features fully developed. Uh, you can work on some features more than others as you're starting out. Uh, so get your toe wet if you haven't done PBL before. Shoot for the gold standard, but don't worry if you, it takes some time to get there. Typically, it does take uh, two to three years for teachers to feel effective at project-based learning. But once they do, once they, they feel like they're doing pretty well with project-based learning, they and their students don't want to go back. It's, it's enjoyable. It's a rewarding way to teach. So PBL is good for teachers as well as students. So this is all captured, as I said, in our, our gold standard model. We also have a model for project-based teaching, which has um, got seven elements to it, also focused on, on those student learning goals. And the practices we're going to be talking about in the, a new book coming out from ASCD next fall, uh, as yet untitled, without a cover. But um, next fall, look for that from, from us and from ASCD about project-based teaching. Because a lot of the things you do as a project-based teacher are things you do in a regular classroom. Um, for example, managing activities or providing scaffolding for students, assessing their learning. And a lot of those same traditional tools can still be used. Uh, they're just used in a, in a different context within a project. So you still use things that are research-based like formative assessment and feedback and, um, and, and collaboration and, and um, uh, building student speaking skills and listening skills and you know, critical conversations and so forth. So, a lot of the traditional things you use already can be used in a project, but now there's a motivating context for students to sort of be, um, be taught via, via those teaching practices. Okay, so uh, that about wraps things up. I can take some questions now, and there's a way to stay in touch with us. We're on social media, and if you want to check me out on Twitter or my email, I'll be glad to answer any questions that way.